Karen DeYoung on her biography of Colin Powell. She's interviewed by Charles Brower, former Army aide to President Reagan. Tonight on Book TV, Warlord, former Marine Ilario Pantano on morality, American society, and the war in Iraq. Coming up at 10 p.m. Eastern, Executive Secrets, William Dougherty on covert action and the American presidency. And at 3.30 a.m. Eastern, a panel on the legality of Google's print program, which would make the books of major libraries available online. And now an argument that the Islamic prophet Muhammad taught his followers to be tolerant of other faiths. From author Karen Armstrong. She spoke about her book, Muhammad, A Prophet for Our Time, at this event hosted by the Mosaic Foundation. It's an hour, 20 minutes. I'm particularly honored today to introduce our distinguished speaker, Karen Armstrong, who will speak, as just we just heard, on Islam, the misunderstood religion. Her presentation, which will last for 40, 45 minutes, will be followed by a Q&A session. Special cards have been placed uh, on your seat in case you are sitting on your card. Take it out. And uh, these are the cards uh, that uh, you should use to write your questions. And toward kind of like the end in about half an hour or so, if you uh, have a question uh, for Ms. Armstrong, please just raise your hand with your card and one of the staff people will come to you and gather, the, collect these cards and bring them out here to the uh, podium. Karen Armstrong was born in 1944 in Wildmore, Worcestershire, England. From 1962 to 69, she was a nun in the Catholic Order of the Society of the Holy Child Jesus. She left the convent in 1969 to pursue a degree in modern literature from Oxford University. She has since taught modern literature at London University and lectured at London's prestigious Leo Beck College for the training of reform uh, rabbis, among other institutions uh, in Europe and here in the States, where she served as a visiting uh, professor. By the early 90s, Karen became known as one of the world's leading historians and media commentators on religion and spiritual matters. Our special speaker has been described by her critics over the years as brilliant, controversial, prolific, provocative, rebellious, sharp-tongued, original, a bridge builder, and, quote, arguably the most lucid, wide-ranging, and consistently interesting religion writer today, end of quote. Indeed, Karen Armstrong is all of that and a lot more. She is one of the most provocative original thinkers on the role of religion in, modern, in the modern world. Her 1993 bestseller, A History of God, has been justifiably described by literary critics as, quote, magisterial and brilliant, end of quote. As far as today's subject matter is concerned, her valuable contribution to the objective analysis and study of Islam over the past two decades has been quite unparalleled. The economists praise her biography of the Prophet Muhammad as, quote, respectful without being reverential, knowledgeable without being pedantic, and above all, readable, end of quote. In my humble judgment, these qualities extend to the overall body of literature that Karen Armstrong has produced on Islam. One of the most striking qualities that Karen Armstrong exhibits in her voluminous work on religion, particularly Islam, is her intellectual integrity. Karen is not known to mince words, to sweep sensitive issues under the rug, to shun controversial questions, or to challenge conventional wisdom. Just in the past few months, her columns in The Guardian covered such topic, uh, topics as the paradox of veiling in Muslim society, the remarks on Islam by Pope Benedict XVI, President Bush's affinity with the Christian right, and her indictment of radical, violent Islam as heretic illustrate her courage and inventiveness. As most of you already know, Karen Armstrong has been a one-woman publishing industry. After publishing her first book, Through the Narrow Gate, back in 1981, which described her seven years as a nun in the Society of the Holy Child Jesus, Karen published countless articles and at least uh, 15 to 20 books, I uh, failed to count the exact number here, on religion, including several bestsellers. They include A History of God, From Abraham to the Present, The 4,000-Year Quest for God, Buddha, Islam, A Short History, 
the spiral staircase, and more, most recently, the great transformation, the beginning of our religious traditions. Three of these books uh, by Karen Armstrong on Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, namely A History of God, Jerusalem, One City, Three Faiths, and The Battle for God, focus on the least common denominator unifying the three monotheistic religions. Ladies and gentlemen, at this turbulent juncture in history that is unfortunately characterized by clash of cultures, intolerance, religious bigotry, people on all sides are desperately groping for answers to unfolding political and social conflicts. While some seek short-term remedy in simplistic pseudo-academic analysis and sensationalist media coverage of these complex issues, it gives the Mosaic Foundation, and it gives me personally a great pleasure to introduce to you Karen Armstrong. Your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here with you, as I say at this, as we say at this turbulent <clears throat> juncture of history. How did I get interested uh, in Islam in the first place? I was, after all, uh, my ambition in life was not to write about religion at all, but to be a university professor teaching English literature. Um, but after a series of career disasters, <coughs> I found myself in television. And um, I said that once to Bill Moyers, and he said, oh, we take anybody. <laughs> and, uh, um, and I found myself in Jerusalem making a program about early Christianity. And there <clears throat> I had a sort of revelation, a personal revelation. Until that time, despite the fact that I'd had a very strong religious background, I found I knew nothing at all about Juda either Judaism or Islam. I'd never thought about Judaism as anything but a kind of prelude to Christianity, and I'd never really considered Islam at all. But once you're living in the holy city, uh, seeing the three religions jostling, sometimes uneasily together around the same sacred sites, you become aware not only of the, uh, the, the, the antagonism that has unfortunately developed between them, exacerbated by political factors, but also of the great affinity and connection that they have between them. So I started to study uh, all three. And I must say it was my study of both Judaism and Islam that brought me back to a set religion. Uh, it gave, it made me, enabled me to see what my own tradition had been trying to do at its best. Um, and I was increasingly disturbed to find the current uh, opinion of Islam, we're talking way back in the early 1980s, uh, was so much at variance with the facts. And this disturbed me for two reasons. One, I'd been trained at Oxford, and I'm sure that the, it would be the same of any of your great American universities too, uh, always to see both sides of a question that you couldn't just write an essay presenting one side of the question. You had to include and seriously consider the other side. You had to be prepared to change your mind. You had to be accurate and, and, and uh, uh, build your theories and ideas on the facts. Uh, and it offended me, uh, intellectually offended me, to hear what people were saying about Islam, that it was an inherently violent, intolerant faith. It wasn't true. Second, it disturbed me because in Europe uh, we have had a long history of bigotry. Um, they, it was this kind of uh, bigoted, lazy, uh, prejudiced thinking uh, that had led to the death camps uh, in, the, in the 1930s. And we didn't seem to have learned anything about, from this dreadful catastrophe. And so I started uh, to talk about uh, trying to correct the stereotypes. And I found that our Islamophobia is very, very old in the Western world. It dates back to the time of the Crusades, a time when uh, Europe was beginning to crawl out of the long period of barbarism known as the Dark Ages in the uh, 10th, 11th centuries and crawl back onto the, to the international scene. 
And um, Islam and Judaism both became the shadow self of Europe, a symbol of everything that we hoped we were not and feared that we might be. And it was during the Crusades, for example, when uh, it was Christians who were fighting brutal holy wars against Muslims in the Holy Land, that scholars in Europe in the 12th century began to describe Islam as the violent religion of the sword. It was a kind of projection of a buried worry about their own behavior. Jesus, after all, had in, in one gospel told his followers to love their enemies, not to exterminate them. And uh, worries about the intensely unchristian uh, nature of their hatred and, uh, and, and in, in, it made them push that, uh, uh, that, that uh, religion of the sword onto the other. It also, at a time when uh, the popes were trying to impose celibacy on the extremely reluctant clergy, uh, Muhammad, the prophet, was described with a great deal of ill-concealed envy as a lecher and a sexual pervert. And Islam was described as a religion that had encouraged uh, um, Muslims to uh, pander to their basest instincts. Um, and it was at a time when Europe was extremely hierarchical against the egalitarian ethos of the gospel uh, that uh, Islam was described as uh, giving too much power and respect to menials, uh, to the lower classes, and to women. Um, so there's, there's, there's a, 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 Islam was becoming the shadow self of Europe as we were trying to redefine ourselves, redefine West, a new style of Western Christianity, very different from the Eastern Orthodox Christianity. Uh, Islam became the bogey and the shadow self. Judaism, too. Uh, it was during the Crusades when very often uh, people who couldn't go to the Middle East to fight would, would attack Jews at home uh, as part of the crusading effort. Um, it was at this time that Jews were first described as child slayers. Uh, it was said that every year at Passover, uh, Jews would kill a Christian child and use the blood in the manufacture of matzo, uh, uh, unleavened bread. Uh, and this image of the Jew as the child killer reflects, again, a, a, an almost Oedipal fear of the parent faith, an inability to accept the Jewish roots of, of Judaism. So these, these prejudices are very deep. And so please forgive me if I start <coughs> by talking about jihad and violence. This, this is the one, this is the thing that's, as I say, has been uh, uh, said about Islam now for, for nearly a millennium. Um, and I'm, I apologize to, it, to you because a lot of you are Muslims and know, that the, the, know the facts of the matter. And also to uh, Western members of the audience because since September the 11th I've been saying this uh, so often that I, I, I'm, uh, I feel I ought to apologize for saying it again because surely people have got the point by this time. But unfortunately, what happens every time there is a crisis like the Danish cartoon crisis, all the old skeletons come out of the cupboard and it's, uh, we have to start from scratch. All the, it's, it's so deeply ingrained are these ideas. Um, and it's rather like that uh, child's game, Snakes and Ladders, whereby you, you suddenly land on the snake and then it goes sliding down right that back to the beginning again and off you go again, explaining no, Islam is not a religion of the sword. So forgive me uh, if, if, if I sort of launch into that right now. <clears throat> now, uh, the Quran and, uh, proposed a religion that was not um, a pacifist religion. Uh, it was not the past sort of religion that Christianity was supposed to be. Uh, Christianity it was supposed to be pacifist, but it turned out not to be pacifist at all. Uh, and Islam had a more realistic view. It, it says that sometimes um, uh, it was unfortunately necessary to fight uh, to, in order to preserve decent values, but only in self-defense. There must be no aggressive warfare. And there were, there were strong rules later developed uh, that, uh, for example, you could never kill, uh, in Sharia law, you must never kill civilians. It was illegal for 
um, a, a ruler to attack a country where Muslims were allowed to practice their religion freely. Uh, it was forbidden to use fire uh, in, in, in fighting, which, as, as it was too cruel. Uh, you, again, the blazing towers of September the 11th come to mind, and uh, entirely um, an illegal, um, an, an illegal and heretical, not to say inhumane, act was committed in the name of Islam. Um, the Quran insists uh, that Muhammad was fighting uh, a, a war of self-defense. Mecca, uh, the si powerful city of Mecca, was attacking the Muslim community. And had uh, the Meccans prevailed, according to the customs of pre-Islamic Arabia, they would have sla slaughtered all the men and uh, sold the women and children into slavery. Uh, the, the Muslim community was fighting for survival. But as always happens in warfare, um, as we found in our own day, warfare has its own awful dynamic and atrocities are committed uh, on, on all sides. And that, in, in, in the end, I think, pushed Muhammad to in initiate a peaceful, uh, non-violent riposte. Uh, when he s the tide was just beginning in Arabia as a whole, though not in Medina, where he had a great deal of opposition, uh, he, he, began, he, in, he announced to his followers that he wanted to make the Hajj pilgrimage uh, to Mecca. Now, on the Hajj, as you know, uh, it's a, it, you may not carry any weapons. You may not fight. You may not even kill an insect or speak a cross word. Now, uh, so for m uh, Muslims in the height of this lethal war with Mecca, to ride unarmed into the holy city of Mecca was going unarmed into the lion's den. Nevertheless, a thousand Muslims from Medina uh, volunteered to go on this highly dangerous campaign. And they arrived in, um, and the Meccans, when they heard they were coming, sent their cavalry out to kill the pilgrims. Uh, but with the help of some friendly local Bedouin, uh, Muhammad managed to elude them and get into the sac sanctuary of Mecca where all violence was forbidden. And then he sat down. It's, it was a demonstration, what in the 60s we used to call a sit-in. Um, and he basically, uh, the eyes of Arabia were on him. He knew, he, he, was, he, was, he was brilliant uh, man, uh, and he knew that he was putting the uh, Meccans on the spot. Because if they slaughtered uh, peaceful pilgrims who were punctiliously pursuing the rights and denying them the right of every Arab to perform the rights of the Hajj at the Kaaba, uh, they would have violated the sanctities that they had been fighting for and would have lost enormous prestige. They were the guardians of the Kaaba, so they negotiated. And Muhammad accepted terms, as the Quran says Muslims must do, that seemed utterly uh, appalling to his followers uh, because it seemed to give everything away to Mecca, everything that they'd, they'd fought for. Um, and yet, nevertheless, and they, they, all, they almost mutinied the pilgrims who were with him. Nevertheless, he persisted. And on the way home, uh, he had a revelation whereby he said that this was a manifest victory. It was not a defeat. That the Muslim, that the, um, the Meccans had behaved with uh, all the chauvinism and violence of jahiliya, a word I'm going to talk about in a minute, uh, the pre-Islamic period. Uh, and whereas, and, and whereas the Muslims uh, the, had experienced the sakina, the spirit of peace which had descended upon them. And it was this spirit of peace that linked them with the Jews and the Christians, the people of the book. Uh, this, it was this, the spirit of peace, that characterizes uh, uh, human, uh, the human attitude towards God. So um, the... Uh, and, and the historians, early historians of Islam, agree that this was indeed a victory. This was the turning point. Uh, this, uh, two, two years later, uh, Mecca opened its gates voluntarily to uh, uh, the Prophet. Nobody was forced to convert to Islam. Um, and, uh, uh, and Muhammad had brought peace to war-torn, war-weary Arabia. 
Uh, there is a very important hadith uh, which, uh, ex which is much, much quoted uh, that describes the attitude to war. Um, it's said that on returning from a battle, a very important battle, Muhammad said to his followers, we are returning from the lesser jihad, uh, and that is the battle, and going, for, to, and going back to the greater jihad, the greater struggle to reform our own society and our own hearts. Uh, jihad, of course, she says wearily, having said this so many times since 9-11, does not really mean holy war, whatever the extremists or whatever the media tells us. It means effort or struggle or endeavor. And Muslims are enjoined to struggle on all fronts to put the word of God into practice in a violent and traumatic world. Um, and uh, so... Uh, and, so, and sometimes it may be necessary to fight, but you must also engage in a, an intellectual jihad, a social jihad, um, an economic jihad to uh, ensure that uh, there is decency and justice in your society, um, a, a, a spiritual jihad uh, as you struggle with the egotism and uh, hatred uh, that mars human relationships. Uh, now, the so-called wars of conquest need to be addressed. After Muhammad's death, uh, the, um, the, the uh, leaders of Islam, uh, the Arabs, came out of the peninsula. And at a, at a very uh, extraordinary moment, the great powers of the region, Persia and Byzantium, had been at war with one another and were both destroyed and exhausted by this, this war effort. And they just keeled over uh, before the, the Arab armies. Much to their surprise, they soon found they had um, a, uh, an empire that stretched uh, by 100 years after the Prophet's death from the Himalayas to the Pyrenees. But uh, these wars had, real, well, at the time, had no religious uh, um, significance. The people who were waging these wars were politicians. Uh, they were generals, they were soldiers, they, had, they, were, they were clear uh, practical uh, difficulties about living peacefully in Arabia where the acquisition raid, the Ghazu, was part of the economy. Uh, where the, well, what we, they to do with people who were inherently aggressive and would go back to fighting one another, let, let, take them out uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a war. It wasn't until later that these wars were regarded as somehow sacred and nobody in the subject uh, world was forced to convert to Islam. In fact, for the first hundred years after uh, the <coughs> Prophet, um, there, uh, the, the, his conversion uh, was actually frowned upon. It was thought that Islam was a religion for the Arabs, for the children of Ishmael, as uh, Judaism was uh, for the sons of Jacob uh, and Israel and uh, Christianity was for the followers of Jesus. That, and this brings me to my next point, that is the extraordinary pluralism of the Quran. It was one of the things that first drew me to uh, Islam. We're always being told that uh, Islam is an in inherently not only violent, but also intolerant religion. The Quran insists that there must be no compulsion in religion, religious matters, but also that all religious uh, rightly guided religion comes from God. Uh, the prophets of the Jews and the, and the and prophet Jesus is honored and respected. You cannot be a Muslim unless you also uh, acknowledge the prophecy of Jesus, uh, Moses, Abraham. And there are Muslim scholars today who say that had the Arabs known about uh, the Buddhists and the Hindus, uh, or indeed the Australian Aborigines or the American Indians, uh, the Quran would have praised their religious leaders too because every people on the face of the earth has been sent a prophet from God in, and a scripture in their own language according to their own cultural tradition. Uh, crucial to this is the story of the, the night journey, um, <clears throat> the, the archetypal spiritual uh, experience of, uh, of, of Muslims. Sufi spirituality is based on this story of Muhammad's night journey to Jerusalem and his ascent to heaven. Uh, you know the story, of course. One night, Muhammad was sleeping 
beside uh, the Kaaba, and he was conveyed, perhaps in spirit, to Jerusalem, to the Temple Mount. Um, and there he was greeted by all the great prophets of the past who welcomed him into their midst and he asked, them, asked the prophet Muhammad to preach to them. And then he ascended like a, a Jewish mystic through the seven heavens to the divine throne, meeting on the way other great prophets, uh, Adam, uh, Moses, uh, with whom he conversed about the number of times Muslims should pray. Uh, and M Moses thought he was being, he, Muhammad wanted them to uh, pray sort of like 10 times a day, and Moses said, don't even go there. This is quite unrealistic, uh, and kept sending uh, Muhammad back to God uh, to, get, uh, to get the number of obligatory prayers reduced. Now, the importance of this story is it's a story of pluralism. It shows, first of all, Muhammad yearning to bring the Arabs who felt left out of the divine plan because they hadn't had a prophet before, to bring the Arabs from far off Arabia right into the heart of the monotheistic family there in Jerusalem. And the prophets listen to one another. The, the prophets of the past don't revile Muhammad as a, as a charlatan, and he doesn't tell them that you know, he's superseding them all. Uh, it's, it's absolutely clear uh, that they listen to one another another's insights, and, Mah and uh, the, the, the prophets are all brothers, uh, all of them, what, 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 whoever they may be, this vast multitude of messengers from God. And the fact that this is the archetypal spiritual experience of Muslims, it, 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 uh, re repeat, it, it gives an indication of the path that we all have to make when we return to the divine source of our being. The fact that this pluralism is built into this archetypal, paradigmatic, spiritual experience shows uh, that uh, the, the pluralism is essential to the Quran, and this is the voice of Islam that we want to hear in the world today, to counter that, the voice of the extremists. Now, constantly in the Quran, uh, in an English translation, uh, we're having, hearing dreadful things about infidels, um, and uh, this, uh, which is, or unbelievers, this is a very bad translation of kafirun or jahilun. Uh, ka ka a kafir, ka kafir is not an unbeliever uh, as such. I mean, the, the, the people who Muhammad was criticizing as, as kafirs uh, were, in fact, they believed their theology was quite correct. They believed, all right, that Allah had created the world. The trouble was they weren't acting on this belief. A kafir means ungrateful. Uh, it has the connotations of somebody who is uh, it's proud, self-sufficient, and when something is won wonderful is offered to them, almost spits in the face. Uh, and uh, there were a lot of Meccans who were highly contemptuous of Muhammad's message. Uh, and the same with Jahiliya. Jahiliya is, is a term used by ex extremists, uh, it's, uh, and, it's, and it's also used frequently to describe the pre-Islamic period in, uh, in, in Arabia, before the coming of, of the Prophet. But, um, uh, and it's usually translated the age of ignorance. Now, uh, jahil does, does have connotations of ignorance, but it also means irascible, violent, chauvinist, um, somebody who thinks that his sunnah, his way of life, is superior to everybody else's, somebody who feels in, in, who believes in the preemptive strike uh, rather that, uh, and doesn't wait uh, to be attacked first. Now, there's an awful lot of jahiliya around at the moment, uh, not only in the Muslim world, and not only in the religious world either. Um, now, when Muhammad is talking about, you know, go, he, 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 uh, he, Muhammad is a general, and in some of these passages, he says, go after the kafirun, uh, go after the jahilu, uh, go after them. Now, when a general is dispatching his troops into battle, I'm sure this is happening in Iraq every day, um, the American and British generals do not tell them, look, guys, go in there and turn the other cheek. Uh, they, you, 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 a general will urge his troops on. Uh, 
But at the end of these adjurations to fight bravely in battle, uh, the Quran nearly always finishes up saying, but forgiveness is better for you. Peace is better for you. The moment the enemy asks for peace, lay down your arms, etc. And that, those are not quoted by either the extremists or the enemies of Islam. It's like people who... Uh, uh, in, in, in Christians who support the idea of capital punishment uh, by saying the Lord Jesus says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Uh, they omitting to mention that Jesus goes on then to say, but I say to you, love your enemies, don't retaliate, don't judge. Uh, th so when you, you, you mu the Quran insists that you must not quote things out of context. You must always wait and see how each verse, each revelation, e each ayah uh, fits in with the whole. Uh, and uh, so you must always see the things whole. Now, when he, so Muhammad was not giving a blanket uh, uh, approval for Muslims everywhere to, to slay unbelievers, people who don't follow Islam. Every, this was a very small community and the Quran knew exactly, uh, the people, who, the first Muslims knew exactly who Muhammad was talking about. They were people like Abu Sufyan, Abu Jahil, uh, people, know, their kinsmen, people known to them all in Mecca, um, with whom later Muhammad made peace. Uh, and uh, so it, it was rather like in, in Mrs. Thatcher's day, <coughs> Uh, there were a bunch of conservative members of parliament in Westminster known as the wets. Uh, Mrs. Thatcher called them, you know, wet, uh, a, a British idiom for, you know, feeble and feeble-minded. And, um, <clears throat> and, and everybody knew exactly who those wets were. Similarly, on John Major's time, if you'll excuse the not very polite language, there were a whole bunch of other conservative MPs known as the bastards. And everybody knew these three or four uh, people uh, who, and it's the same in the Quran. This is not a blanket uh, uh, command to go and slaughter anybody who doesn't accept Islam. It is, it is this was, uh, people knew who these uh, kafirun were. And later there was peace with them. Uh, and, and, and some of these kafirs, uh, be, uh, be, uh, accepted very high office indeed in the, uh, in the Islamic uh, community. Now, <clears throat> there is so much to say. Um, I can't uh, dwell too much on the position of women, you know, another of those endless chestnuts. Uh, I, I just say in um, um, a passing that none of the great world religions has proved to be very good for women. Um, and... <clears throat> And some of them, some of them, like it, Christianity and Islam, start with a very good message for women. And then a few generations later, the men hijack the faith and drag it back to the old patriarchy. And that's what's happened uh, in Islam. But we can go into all that in question time, if you like, because there's so much to talk about. Um, now, I... There, there's a phenomenon, ha though, uh, that's always associated with Islam, it, and it is called fundamentalism. This is a most unsatisfactory term, as I'm sure you know. It doesn't apply well to Muslims. It was coined uh, by Christian Protestants at the turn of the 20th century who, to describe their reform movement. They were going back to the fundamentals of Christianity, they say, but this doesn't translate well uh, into Arabic uh, or it, it, and people not quite understandably resent having this Christian Western term foisted on their movements. But I hope if I occasionally call, mention fundamentalism, please forgive me because we're galloping towards the end of this lecture and, uh, and the word has come to, to stand in common parlance for a group of uh, militant, militant sort of piety that has erupted in every single major world religion in the course of the 20th century. Uh, of the three monotheistic religions, Islam was the last to develop a kind of fundamentalist strain in the late 1960s. The first fundamentalist movement, as I say, was here in the United States, uh, in a, uh, founded in the, about the 1920s. So 
Uh, every single one of these movements, whether we're talking about fundamentalism in Christianity, Ju uh, Judaism, Islam, uh, Hinduism, Sikhism, Hin uh, uh, Confucianism in China, is all these movements are rooted in a profound fear. Uh, every single movement of these that I've studied in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam is convinced that modern Western society wants to wipe them out. Even here in the States, uh, the people, uh, Chris, many Christians in small town America feel colonized by what is to them the alien ethos of Harvard or Yale or Washington, D.C. Uh, and so uh, there's a fear. Fundamentalists uh, want to uh, are disturbed by this secular society in every region of the world where a modern secular western style society has been established a christian counter uh, uh, a, i beg your pardon a religious countercultural movement has grown up alongside it in conscious rejection they want to drag god and or religion from the sidelines to which they've been relegated in modern secular culture and back to center stage and in this they've achieved some considerable success because in the middle of the 20th century it was generally taken for granted that uh, uh, secularism was the coming ideology and that never again would religion play a major role in international events. Well, uh, that was proved not to be a correct prophecy. Um, what is it about modernity that fills people with such dread? Um, in the 16th century, the countries of Western Europe began to create an entirely different kind of civilization one that had no precedent uh, in world history, was based on a different kind of economy. Instead of relying on a surplus of agricultural produce, which you could sell and trade with and to fund your cultural enterprises, the new Western society was increasingly based on technolo technology, on the technological replication of resources and the constant reinvestment of capital. And this changed everything. It sounds dry and dull, but it changed everything. Uh, in order to fund these, uh, you know, to make these societies productive, we, develop, we, they, we, we had to change our entire way of living, our way of thinking and social systems in the West. There were, therefore, bloody revolutions uh, in, the, in these turbulent centuries when Europe uh, were, and later the United States was modernizing. Uh, there were bloody revolutions succeeded by reigns of terror, succeeded by dictatorships, succeeded by horrible wars of religion in the, in the 17th century. And what are we seeing today when part, other parts of the world are modernizing, but bloody revolutions, wars of religion, uh, uh, sectarian strife, etc., uh, and dictatorships. The, the, the modernization process, like any major social change of this level, is extremely traumatic. And for some, many of the Muslim countries, the conditions have been very difficult because instead of having 300 years in which to modernize, they've had to do it yesterday, uh, far too rapidly. And that has caused all kinds of social, social stress. Democracy was not conceived in the West simply because we're such frightfully nice chaps that we wanted to give the, the plebs a share in the governing process of the country. It was found to be essential to a modern productive society. The more, uh, mo as, as modernization proceeded, more and more people had to be brought into the production process, even at a quite humble level as office clerks or factory workers or printers. And that meant they had to have a little bit of education and the more they were educated, the more inevitably they began to demand a voice in uh, government. And it was found by trial and error that those countries that did democratize went ahead and were more productive and successful than those uh, which tried to hog the benefits of community and confine it to a small elite. Uh, so, uh, democracy was found, it was, as I say, it was part of modernization. 
Um, and we still were fighting for it, uh, you know, in the t early 20th century. Women didn't get, weren't fully emancipated and given the vote until uh, the 1930s, after they had been brought into the production process themselves during the two world wars. So uh, all this talk about democracy as though it's descended from Mount Sinai or something, uh, this is part of modernization. And it's not always easy to uh, impose on modernizing countries that have still not completed the painful rite of passage from pre-modern to modern society. Um, now, every single um, Muslim, every, I'm sorry, let me start this sentence again. Every single um, modern society has to have two characteristics. The modern spirit uh, has to have two characteristics, and however many skyscrapers or um, uh, computers uh, or fighter jets you have, if you don't have these two mental qualities, you're not really modern. First is independence. Modernization in Europe was uh, preceded by declarations of independence on all fronts. Political, uh, the, the 4th of July Declaration of Independence uh, was a typical modernizing document. Religious, Luther, for example, declared independence of the Roman Catholic Church. Intellectual, uh, and inventors and scientists demanded the freedom to think for themselves without being supervised or penalized by the hierarchical church. Intellectual independence, crucial. Economic independence, free markets, crucial. The second quality was innovation. Um, we, even though it was very traumatic, the process of modernization from the 16th to the 19th century, causing great suffering and warfare uh, as we modernized, it was exciting because we were always doing something new, achieving something fresh, pitting ourselves against unprecedented problems and coming up with wholly novel solutions. Now, in some of the Muslim world, the new modern economy and modern society did not come with independence, but with colonial subjugation. Colonial, so you, instead of independence, you have dependence. And instead of innovation, you have imitation, because uh, in, we, we were so far ahead, you could only copy us. And this means that the wrong kind of ingredients have been going into some of these societies. It's rather like a cake. Uh, if you are given, uh, you're told to make a cake, but you don't have all the uh, ingredients, you instead, instead of uh, flour, you only have ground rice, or instead of fresh eggs, you ha have only powdered egg, and you don't have a correct kind of oven, you're not going to get this lovely, fluffy, black chocolate gatto uh, in the cookbook. You could have something very nasty indeed. And the, some of these, uh, and because modernization has proceeded so rapidly, secularization has been experienced at, with horror in some of these countries. When Ataturk modernized Turkey, for example, he closed down the madrasas and forced all men and women into Western dress. So, because these reformers wanted their countries to look modern, never mind the fact that the vast mass of the population were not acquainted with Western society, had no understanding of the new secularized institutions. Uh, the Shahs in Iran used to have their soldiers go out with their bayonets out, taking off the women's veils and ripping them to pieces in front of them. On one occasion, Shah Reza Pahlavi gave his soldiers in 1935 orders to shoot at hundreds of unarmed demonstrators in one of the holiest shrines of Iran who were peacefully protesting against obligatory Western clothes and hundreds of Iranians were killed that day. Uh, in uh, Egypt, uh, President Nasser interred thousands of members of the Muslim Brotherhood. Often, uh, they, these young men had done nothing more inflammatory than handing out leaflets or attending a meeting. But in these prisons, uh, th th they uh, developed what we call a fundamentalist ideology. One of the, uh, ch one of the people who was in uh, the, one of these prisons was Saeed Qutb, uh, who uh, is the founder of a, a, a lot of the, 
uh, Osama bin Laden follows his uh, kind of uh, school of thought. And uh, when he looked around this camp, he went into the camp as a moderate. When he looked around this camp and heard at the same time Nasser vowing to secularize Egypt on the Western model, separating religion and politics, secularism did not seem lovely. Uh, it seemed jahili. Uh, it, seemed, it seemed barbarous and, and aggressive and, and evil. But interestingly, Said Qutub did not declare war on the West. All these movements begin as inter-religious movements, uh, fighting um, against uh, their own people, their own fellow countrymen. And only at a secondary stage, if at all, do they turn against a foreign foe. Um, now, <clears throat> it's very important to note that um, these movements, whether they're Christian, Jewish, or Muslim, are not orthodox. Um, they are, you know, we often say, obviously, with people like Osama bin Laden around, this proves that Islam is a violent uh, religion. Uh, these movements are unorthodox. Indeed, they're anti-orthodox. They are highly innovative. If you look at the Christian right, for example, who ha here in the States, who've got this idea about rapture, um, you know, that on, people are going to be taken up into heaven and, and, and watch the tribulation of the last days, um, and then Antichrist will descend to earth and slaughter all the Jews, etc. This, uh, this is an entirely new uh, novel interpretation of the book of Revelation. I'm afraid it was launched on the world by a Brit. Um, uh, but it uh, has to be said for my own people that he had no takers in England, uh, but he did... <laughs> He did very well when he crossed the Atlantic and came to the United States. But it, you, could, you could define this, this rapture as heresy. Uh, it, is, it is utterly a, a variance with a new. Similarly, Ayatollah Khomeini uh, was highly unorthodox as a Shiite. For centuries, uh, Shiites had, as a matter of sacred principle, separated religion and politics and did not take part in, uh, in, in politics. So for a cleric to declare that he should be, or, or a cleric or an, ima, uh, an ayatollah should be head of state was as shocking to Shiite sensibilities as though the pope should abolish the mass. Um, and uh, similarly, Qutub, uh, his, his ideas were entirely unorthodox. This idea that Osama bin Laden has that, you know, we've got a, the whole world has got to be converted to Islam, entirely new. And, the, and similarly, the putting jihad, meaning holy war, at the center of your ideology is, was a new and controversial step. First, first major, there'd been some idiots and fanatics, you know, beforehand who'd occasionally done this, but not a major thinker. The first major thinker to do this was uh, the, the Pakistani ideologue, Maududi, in the 1950s. Uh, and he knew, and he was very aware that this was a controversial step, occasioned by the current emergency of the rising tide of colonialism, et cetera, uh, domination, Western domination, etc. And Qutub, when said, you know, how can you ha have this high, hard line ideology uh, you know, when, when the Quran specifically says there must be no compulsion in religion, how do you m judge these? How can you reconcile this? Who just say this is an emergency again? Uh, until we've got a, a better style of leadership and government, when we can't afford this kind of tolerance. They are aware that this is controversial and are stepping out into new uncharted territory. So it's very important to note all fundamentalist movements, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, are unorthodox uh, uh, and, and are heretical in the sense that they are, go in the word Greek, in Greek that means going your own way. Uh, it's, they are new developments, modern developments that could have taken root in no time other than our own. <clears throat> now, of course, um, you are, we, history also shows, I'll just throw this in, that when you attack these movements, they become more extreme. 
And uh, that's, that's happened, uh, it happened in, in, among the Christian right, uh, it happened, it's happened in Judaism, for example. Fundamentalism took two major step forwards. One, after the Nazi Holocaust, when Hitler had been trying to exterminate European Jewry. And second, after the 1973 war of Yom Kippur, when you have a new style of religious Zionism. Uh, religious Zionism, that would have once have been an unthinkable thing. Uh, because at the well, in the early days of the Zionist movement, the Orthodox Jews, nearly all, with one very notable exception, uh, regarded uh, Zionism as heretical and a great evil. Um, so, uh, but, but, so that's that's another instance. But so, where because these movements are rooted in fear and a, a dread of annihilation, of fighting for survival, when you attack them, even verbally. Uh, they become more extreme. Uh, it, it, it's because it, that fulfills their expectation of annihilation. It says, yeah, they're right. They, they really are out to get us. So that's something to bear in mind. Of course, there is no inherent clash of civilizations. Uh, this is um, at the turn of the 20th century. Nearly every single leading Muslim intellectual, again with one notable exception, uh, al Afghani, uh, was in love with the West and they wanted their countries to look just like Britain and France, who at that time were the chief purveyors of modernity. Uh, there's a very famous story of the Grand Mufti of Egypt, Muhammad, about Muhammad Abdu, a great reformer. Um, who hated, hated the British occupation of his country, but was very much at home in European culture, uh, very much at home with Europeans. And after a visit to Paris, he returned to Egypt and said, in Islam, in, no, let me start again, I always get this muddled up. In France, I saw Islam, but no Muslims. In Egypt, I see Muslims, but no Islam. And what he meant was that in their modern, modernized economies, the Europeans were better able to create the kinds of equal conditions that approximate to the Quranic ideal than the unmodernized Muslim countries. Uh, in Iran, uh, secular intellectuals and leading clerics in 1906 um, joined forces uh, to uh, f demand uh, a constitution and representational government, a uh, constitutional revolution. And they got their constitution, uh, but unfortunately parliament was never able to uh, function properly until after the Iranian revolution because uh, the, a few couple of years after the revolution, the British discovered oil in Iran and they weren't about to allow uh, a, a, an Iranian parliament to scupper their plans for uh, uh, Iranian oil, which they used to fuel the British Navy. Um, now, uh, in, after the, uh, but nevertheless, after the constitution uh, had been uh, achieved, the leading ayatollah, one of the leading ayatollahs at that time living in Najaf, uh, said uh, that the new constitution was the next best thing to the coming of the Shiite Messiah because it would limit the tyranny of the Shahs and therefore it was a project worthy of the Shia. Um, and it's poignant to look back on this early enthusiasm. Muslims saw and understood uh, the, the, the whole democratic, representational ideals of modernity and recognized it as deeply congenial with their own traditions. Unfortunately, uh, politics, uh, especially our foreign policies, wrecked this. The question of Palestine, for example. Um, and we have to see, uh, it's important to say that um, Fundamentalist movements, I don't, I'm sorry about this word, but I'm, we are coming to the end, um, are not inherently violent. 
uh, of the people who take part in these groups and ideologies, only a tiny, tiny proportion take part in acts of terror and violence. Most are simply trying to live what they regard as a good religious life in a world that seems increasingly hostile to religion. Um, so, um, but where but there has been, for good or ill, uh, a religious revival in the second half of the 20th century. There's certainly one going on here in the United States. Western Europe is the only uh, place that is re resisting this trend, but we are beginning to look increasingly endearingly old-fashioned in our secularism here. We're, 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 we're a bit old-fashioned and losing it. The rest of the world is showing that they want in all kinds of ways, some good, some not so good, some, as the Buddhists would say, highly unskillful, some even lethal, uh, are showing in all kinds of ways that they want to see religion reflected in public life. Uh, many, very often these movements can be described as a new form of nationalism, a new form of patriotism. That's certainly true of the Christian right, who have a very different ideal from uh, that of, the, uh, of Jeff, Thomas Jefferson, for example. Um, and... Um, <clears throat> They want to see not a secular nation, but a, a, a Christian nation here. Um, and um, the uh, uh, religious Zionism uh, in, in, in Israel is deeply patriotic and sees uh, the, the secular state of Israel as sacred and, and, and holy. Um, and similarly, in the Muslim world, where nationalism was a foreign idea, and actually not a very good idea of the 19th century in Europe. I mean, nationalism, we're retreating from it in Europe at the same time as we're foisting it on other parts of the world. It caused two major world wars, this kind of national, national jahiliya, chauvinism. Um, and so, um, but, so that the people who uh, have, have never felt in tune with the nationalist ideal are trying to find other religious pre-colonial ways of expressing their, um, the, 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 their, their identity. Furthermore, however, when violence becomes entrenched in a region, where warfare becomes chronic in a region, as, say, in Palestine, Israel, in Afghanistan, in, um, in, in, in Pakistan, in, 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 in all that, that troubled region which had, had, had the trauma of partition, um, you're going... This is where religion becomes violent. Uh, warfare and violence uh, affect everything that we do. Uh, when, if you see, war, if you're living, say, in Gaza or Afghanistan, and every day you see shootings and soldiers and tanks and bulldozing and suicide bombing, this is going to affect your relationships, your aspirations, your dreams, and it's going to affect your religion too. In these societies, religion gets sucked in and becomes a part of the problem, distorted, because very often these movements in their anxiety to defend their tradition often distort it in a, in a, in a, in a gross and, and terrible way. Um, what we need on all sides, we need, we need se several things. Um, <clears throat> We need to learn to listen respectfully to other people's narratives. There are an awful lot of competing narratives in the world at the moment. And uh, say the Israelis have one narrative of, of what happened and, and, and the Palestinians have another, the Americans another, Europeans another, and it, theirs is the only right one. I've just, I've, uh, I was part of an initiative called the Alliance of Civilizations. And last week, uh, to the day, we handed our, uh, our, our report to Kofi Annan in Istanbul. And um, th 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 that what, I, I forget why I introduced this, but um, <laughs> it seemed vital at the time. Uh, but what, yeah, that, because w this is one of our points, that we have to listen to other people's narratives. Second, what we need is self-criticism. We all need, whether we're Westerners or Arabs or Iranians, to look critically at ourselves. Uh, the right is, it always takes two to tango. It is, the right is never all on one side. And Muslims have a fabulous tradition of self-criticism. Um, you can read all about that in my short history of Islam. Uh, but 
uh, where in the early years, say, of, of Muslim history, when there were these terrible disasters, the fitna, the wars, that, uh, uh, the, the killing of the caliphs, um, Muslims didn't say, oh, well, that's the way the cookie crumbles, what can you do? Uh, they sat down and agonized about this. And out of these anguished discussions about how, what had gone wrong with Muslim history came, such, uh, uh, came the Sharia law, came Sufism. Uh, came sh Shia, came a lot of the pieties that have been very, very deeply uh, formative. Of we need, we need to sort that there are things wrong with all our societies, and before we point a finger at the other, let's also look, uh, take a lo long, hard look at ourselves. I'm sure we'll have many things to discuss in the question period, but thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Karen, for your eloquent presentation. Uh, Karen has graciously agreed to spend the balance of our time for the next 20 minutes answering your questions. If you have a question, please pass your card. Um, if you care to identify yourself, I think it would be better. And uh, I'll be glad to present uh, your questions to our uh, guest speaker. Karen, as uh, we regroup and I try to uh, read some of the, uh, I guess we have a lot of medical doctors in the group here, um, <laughs> the handwriting. <laughs> Thanks. Um, you mentioned something about the heretical nature of a lot of these extremist and, and violent uh, uh, movements. Would you care to, you know, I, I read your article a few weeks ago uh, in The Guardian on, on that particular one, your column, I guess on the uh, extremists and, and heresy. Uh, would you care to comment a little bit more in terms of in what respect is it heretical within Islam to have these uh, types of, of violent or extremist movements? Well, uh, as the Quran makes it quite clear, that, and, and, and so does Muslim law, the killing of, of targeting of, of civilians uh, is unacceptable. To ki take one life is to kill the whole world. Uh, and. Uh, the, the ethos of, this, of Islam was a yearning f towards peace and nonviolence, uh, and, and the idea that everybody has to convert to Islam, uh, that it's the only religion. This, again, is uh, really not consonant with uh, Quranic teaching, uh, which res has such respect, and there has been such respect in the Islamic tradition as a whole. Um, and the f th the thrust of Islamic government has been coexistence. Uh, in Jerusalem, for example, Jew under the Muslims, uh, Christians and Jews lived in a harmony that uh, was not Shangri-La, uh, but it was a light years better than anything we've got today. So frankly, I, any movement that resorts to violence, whether it's Jewish, Christian, or Muslim, is heretical because in my latest book, uh, I, uh, we find that uh, an impulse to non-violence, a movement away from violence, as we saw in the prophet Muhammad, uh, in Jesus, turn the other cheek, don't uh, love your enemies, uh, is towards non-violence, even aggressive speech uh, and unkind words uh, are unreligious in my view. Um, and that, that goes for the whole gamut of, uh, of religious traditions, which are based essentially on the golden rule. Don't do to others as you would not have done to you. First propounded by Confucius 500 years before Christ, and really central to the religious ethos. For Confucius, that was religion. And if we did that day by day, hour by hour, as Confucius recommended, if every time we were threatened, we were tempted to say something unpleasant about an annoying colleague or an ex-wife or, um, or a country with whom we're at war and said, how would we like this said of us and desisted? In that moment, we would have transcended ourselves 
and uh, achieved. Uh, uh, you were, if you did that habitually, you would live in the divine. Uh, Muhammad asks, what should American Muslims do to help non-Muslim Americans understand Islam and tone down, hopefully, Islamophobia in this country? What would you advise? Well, what a question. I know it's very... I, what is really needed is, is better media coverage uh, in this country of... Uh, 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 Have you uh, seen Glenn Beck? No, <laughs> I haven't. Thank God. Uh, yes, okay. 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 Uh, but um, I think what, what, something that could be done... Um, I think, is for you to take, for American Muslims to take, as, as it were, a compassionate and truly Islamic offensive. Um, uh, start, that all, after 9-11, a whole lot of interfaith groups mushroomed all over America. It was one of the fabulous things about the initial American response. Start working together. I'm all for dialogue. Um, I'm all for it, but there comes a point when dialogue isn't always frightfully useful. I mean, a, a, a Christian will say, we believe Jesus is the Son of God, and a Muslim will say, we don't, and that's the end of the conversation. Uh, but if you're working together on local issues, fling yourself into local politics, for example, um, uh, or, or indeed national politics, working with other religious groups. If religious people, truly religious people, all over the world joined hands, uh, it would create a, a, a wonderful counter riposte to, to the violence that we're seeing in all levels of society, not just in Islam. Uh, and then when you're working side by side, you discover the commonality. You discover your values in common uh, over time. And I, so I would think that is, I think also we need uh, to encourage really gifted young men to become mullahs. And that's in the, not just in the um, uh, America, but in the Muslim world generally. Often it's the less able boys who are sent to mullah school, while the others go to science or technology or whatever. And in, as the uh, head of Al-Azhar said, uh, to me recently, well, if, you know, all my mullahs will be decent mullahs. And I say, y you know, yeah, but some of them won't be very bright. And what we need are really bright young, in, in, young men. Uh, and, and, and I'd like to see some women, women's voices too. Encourage the women among you. And I'd say to the women, uh, we all, all women, even a highly privileged woman like myself, has knows what it is to be marginalized and patronized and belittled. Let's use that experience of, of, of slight persecution, in my case, tiny, uh, to understand the plight of oppressed people all over the world and bring that to the table. Uh, so encourage your women, encourage your education, and in start studying, uh, really studying uh, the Islamic tradition. Uh, study its depth, its complexity, its multifariousness, um, not just picking out a few, um, you know, verses from the Quran here and there and tossing them around as, as, as in a sort of spiritual tennis match. Because that's, what, that's the way we're all reading our scriptures now in this piecemeal way. And we need really, studying is important and speaking out on issues of justice for all, not just for Muslims. It's hard to be creative when you feel under attack. Uh, we know that in our own personal lives. If we're feeling defensive, we, we don't create very well. But try this. I was with the Dalai Lama uh, in uh, Idaho uh, on September the 11th uh, last year, not, not the one just gone. And a Muslim asked, what can we do? And he said, now is a good time to practice. This is a good time to practice true Islam. Uh, and, and, and then you, I think you could irradiate the world if you really lived according to the high and peaceful Quranic ideal. Uh, you just mentioned the word dialogue. We have one uh, in, in person in the audience who asked, uh, you know, what do you suggest as a good starting point in terms of dialogue between uh, Muslims and evangel you know, evangelistic <laughs> Christians in this country, is there common ground to, that you would recommend to, to start with? Um, well, there's certainly a, I, I, it's always difficult for people to uh, recognize revelations that come later. 
uh, Christi uh, uh, Jews find, have, have had difficulty with Christians and Muslims, and Muslims, apart from the Baha'is, haven't really had that problem. Uh, but I think we've. N I think studying the uh, the values, uh, theology, we must recognize. We must recognize that nobody has the last word about God. God is infinite. God is transcendent, and that means transcendent. Uh, it means he goes beyond our conceptual grasp. And very often, religious people fall into the trap of saying, yes, God is transcendent, but I know what, <laughs> he, what, uh, what he means or what he is. Uh, and this, this is a form of shirk, idolatry, whereby you create a, a sort of an idol, an image of God based on your own, your own self. Uh, now this, so I think approach dialogue in that spirit. We, in the 20th century, we acquired an unprecedented opportunity for understanding other people's faith. Uh, we ha and this is, will change, you have to go into dialogue preparing to be changed. Not just to change the other, but to be changed yourself by, in a creative way by the encounter. Uh, we can be, fight, go in with, not with sort of, now how am I going to convert this person or argue my corner? This is all aggressive and edgy. What can I learn about how to worship the divine? What can I uh, learn from this tradition about uh, justice, the position of justice or equality or the appreciation of other traditions? Um, go in with that spirit. I think we need to move beyond tolerance towards appreciation. And so that it go, so in, in that spirit, knowing that nobody has the last word on God, uh, that, in, uh, that there's a very wonderful Indian tradition, a very, very, very ancient. Uh, in ancient India, priests used to have a contest called the Brahmodya competition, where and one of them would try to define in a riddling, formulaic uh, note the Brahman, the ultimate reality. And his opponent would uh, reply in kind, in an equally riddling, elusive, and poetic way. And the winner was the person who reduced his opponent to silence. Uh, and in that silence, the Brahman was present. Not when there was, ever, there was theological chatter. So dialogue should lead to silent awe and appreciation. And I think if we go in with that attitude, then I think we, we'll all be enriched. Don't go into it in, in, in an antagonistic uh, spirit. There are several questions regarding uh, the hijab, particularly mm. uh, on the uh, European side, I guess. It has become quite controversial mm -hmm. in, in Europe. Uh, could you uh, care to comment on that and uh, in terms of r social ramifications uh, for European society? Yeah, uh, the Europeans are in a funk at the moment um, about uh, their Muslim communities. Um, at a, um, I was at a study day in NATO uh, about 18 months ago and was appalled at the way uh, they, they, they were simply wanted not to see Muslims anymore. Uh, and I said to them, in Europe, we can't talk about people disappearing in however, ever again, in however benign a way. There was, and th there's a strong feeling that this is our society. And if they're going to live here, they've got to conform to, to, to this. I said, uh, I said to them, look, now you're beginning to understand in a tiny, tiny way what it was like for the colonized people when the Europeans came in with power and, all, and changed those societies forever. There's no way that, they, that, that, that you'll begin, use that to appreciate the, the hurt and disruption. Uh, but uh, there's, there's this very aggressive mood in, at the moment. Now, Jack Straw um, has recently come out against the niqab. I have very, I don't think I've been racking my brains. I don't think I've ever seen a niqab in London. I mean, maybe a few here or there in Bradford, but it's a tiny proportion. But it's, it was a very clever ploy because it stopped everybody talking about Iraq for a while, and instead they could uh, all get on their high horses uh, all the pundits and feminists and, and to start talking about the hijab. Um, Europeans uh, are, 
in, as I say, they're in a funk. And um, they've got to realize that uh, really it, history shows that when women are forbidden to wear the veil, they rush in ever-increasing numbers to put it on. <laughs> if you really want to promote understanding, as Jack Straw says, at don't attack the veil. It was Lord Cromer in Egypt who, de who denounced the veil, who made the veil a controversial issue in the first place. This kind of intervention has only made matters worse. And there are all kinds of ways of um, uh, reasons for women wearing the veil. I myself spent my youth very heavily veiled um, as a nun. And nobody ever asked me to take it off. But when, I was, I, when, I was, um, when my order was founded in the 1840s, shortly after emancipation, when the nuns wore their ha religious habits and their veils in the streets of London and other places, they were pelted with rotten eggs. Um, and pe people in Britain fear, had the same fears about Catholics as they had, have now about Muslims. That Catholics were a fifth column uh, in, in, in society, they were, they were an immigrant community. Most of them came from, uh, most of us came from Ireland originally. They uh, would never be assimilated into British culture. Uh, they were associated with tyrannical and corrupt uh, in, uh, countries and governments abroad, Rome and all Spain and all these dreadful places. So, um, but now we've got over that and, we, and, and nuns took off their habits uh, because they felt at home. Uh, I think nobody should be forced to wear anything he or she wants to. Either uh, There's nothing sacred or even particularly becoming about Western dress per se. Um, and you've got to uh, uh, realize that if you want really to promote understanding and harmony, don't attack the veil. Uh, it'll only encourage women this, this girl, for example, who got taken to court because the silly girl did not wear her niqab at her interview when she went to be interviewed for the school, but appeared in splendor uh, wearing this thing. And now, of course, the press has been up in arms about it, and she's a heroine. She really thinks she's struck a blow for Islam by, by this stance when we've got other more important issues to deal with. Uh, so. Uh, let's keep a sense of proportion about, ab about this. Uh, several questions regarding uh, reform uh, in Islam. Is there a contemporary reform Islamic movement, uh, kind of a post-Muhammad Abdu person emerging or in existence? What is the role of the Muslim majority regarding the few extremists who have misinterpreted or misrepresented Islam and the Quran? Uh, well, um, I think, first, first of all, uh, reform movements. There are people like Tariq Ramadan, for example, uh, there have been ple people like uh, President Hatami uh, of Iran. And people are always moaning to me, uh, you know, when I lecture about Islam to a Western audience. They say, where are the moderate Muslims? Well, um, the moderate, you had a moderate Muslim. I don't like the phrase moderate Muslim, I may say. But you had President Hatami in Iran uh, reforming uh, and, and no encouragement did he get from the West at all. Um, and now, look, what, look what's happened. Um, so, um, Surush, Abdul Karim Surush, uh, Ganushi, uh, there, are, there are these important thinkers. Um, and, uh, and young thinkers, too, like uh, Hamza Yusuf. And uh, th th there, are, uh, there are all kinds of of uh, interesting ideas coming forward, and we should try and promote these ideas and push them, push them forward. Interestingly, when I was in Pakistan two weeks ago, uh, uh, the Pakistanis were asking me, where are the moderate Westerners? <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> why do we never hear from people like you uh, anymore? Where are you all? So, uh, so we, you know, we've got to, s uh, I think, uh, what is de there is this is where we need real dialogue and real tough looking uh, because I think there is too often you see what happens say what happened in the tragedy in Lebanon this um, this uh, summer an absolute tragedy and of course 
people look at Hezbollah and the only people who were coming to the, to the, to the aid of the Lebanese uh, were, was Hezbollah. Um, and unfortunately, the, 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 the increasingly bad political atmosphere means that people give uh, support to these, to say, terrorist organizations, at, at least a tacit support, that they, that they really shouldn't, I think. Uh, I can, I, so I think there should be more tough-minded criticism. And it's hard, I know, because uh, very, who is a moderate Muslim? I mean, uh, um, you know, because they, people might disagree with, uh, say, the administration on the issue of Palestine or the issue of the veil or something like that. And, and for, for the administration, that puts them in the, in the uh, sort of bad camp. Uh, of, so we need really to sit down and, and sort out what are our Islamic priorities? What do we f really feel about the killing of civilians? Uh, and, uh, and, and, and speak out. Uh, e because there's a sort of rising tide of malaise, I think. Uh, certainly in, in Britain, I look at our homegrown British bombers uh, who are watching the the news, watching Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo, Palestine, uh, did this uh, abominable action, but also uh, not helped by their mullahs, uh, not helped by British society, uh, feeling ostracized and uh, deprived. It, when malaise sets in and people feel there's no hope uh, and that nothing convention and lose faith in ordinary, traditional, conventional politics, which never seems to go their way, that's when uh, it, you ha can have a slide into condoning things that, that really we shouldn't condone. But it's hard. This is, this, is, this, is, this is real jihad. It's a real 